Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Strata San Jose. I'm here with Rob Kraft. Rob, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? So you're with Google and you're with which group? The cloud group? Yeah, I mean Google Cloud Platform. So one thing I'd like to understand a little bit more is that, you know, we're here in a data event and a lot of people are still talking about BI. But this seems to be the darling of the last couple of years is AI and machine learning. Can you tease out the difference between machine learning and BI? Yeah, uh, um, a lot of people think of um, how do I how do I do something different than what I've already done is if I could understand my data better. And the business intelligence market for the last 20, 25, 30 years in some cases have been driven for taking a large set of data, query it at large scale, provide some sort of visualization against it. So humans can go, oh, I get why that trend happened, past tense. Therefore, the next time we have this problem, we should probably have learned from that or we can improve business or now we understand what the business currently is. And billions of dollars go into that market, a whole lot of technology that's quite difficult to do, a whole lot of licenses out there. Now, for machine learning, the idea is how can I keep my job versus why I should have been fired? So why I should have been fired is largely the, on the chart for the BI if you miss Christmas. If you couldn't get uh, your product from the port in Shanghai because weather came in and you didn't put an option on airlift because that was expensive and you didn't have a model that would tell you, here's the implications if we miss a six hour window at a, a port dock fee, for example. So what machine learning tries to do is to say from these data, how do I put a statistical model together that can predict with very high confidence and uh, uh, shown confidence a particular outcome that matters for my business. And you'll find people doing this a lot around human and system interaction things like vision system, speech, uh, uh, translation services. We get the value of those pretty immediately. Those are, those are immediately crockable. How do I get that from a business process? That's the opportunity in front of a lot of, a lot of the enterprises. How do I understand cash flow and when I should ship a product or hold a product? Or how do I understand when a customer is too expensive to have or lower my cost for a customer? All those things you have data on today. They're just locked behind multiple databases. So we have data on those today, but we also have massive amounts of data. Hmm. How, how does someone manage to, to look at a, a problem and apply some machine learning to just a massively huge problem and still have some sort of real-time result because mm. you don't want, again, that, that answer to be next week or even tomorrow in right. some cases. Yep, so one of the things we've been working on at Google for 14 years at this point is trying to go from rule-based systems to intent fulfillment. In other words, what are the things that the system can satisfy and if you can create um, models or statistical models in this case, machine learning driven systems that satisfy those intent at large scale, the mass of data largely doesn't matter because all the techniques under the covers that so many of us already know like MapReduce, large scale querying systems, uh, we have products like Spanner at Google which are universally consistent and immediately available and transactable with acid support, the things which were seen as non scienceable those things are scienceable today. So can I take petabytes and exabytes of data? Yes, but can I downscale it to uh, gigabytes of data? That's the critical factor for a lot of us because when you go through and do data science and you're using data set, you'll find that a lot of the data is dirty or it's conflicting or there's errors in the data and labeling against that is a whole science in and of itself. Then you train your model and that's where the mathematicians step in from where the computer scientists are today. Tooling is going to improve there massively in the next couple of years. I promise you it's been more abundant for 20 years. A lot of investments coming into the space. And lastly, to your point was predictions. We want to offer inferable predictions, meaning statistically significant predictions which you can debug, which is very difficult with neural networks, uh, within tens of milliseconds. And that goes to millions of times a second or 100 million times a second. So that sounds great. And Google has and been scary. doing it. It sounds well, scary. Yeah, I was going to say, and Google's <laughs> been doing this for a long time. Right. How does a large enterprise that may be a retail company right. get started doing this? Right. So step one um, largely is get big data done. Uh, big data has been floating around as a buzzword, almost the worst name thing in the world. IoT might be worse. What do you call big data? I mean, you're Google. What, That's what it. Is? It's big to you is big enough. And there's two aspects for big that I think are notable because it implies system choices. One is size of data in air or on disk. So is it just a lot of things that have a lot of spending media against it? So that's the traditional definition. The other one is the shape and velocity of the data arrival. 90% mm -hmm. of new data entering an enterprise storage system today is non-structured. 
it's video, it's tweet feeds, it's pictures, it's commentary, it's Word docs that haven't been discovered and might be out of date with incorrect so data. The variety. The variety inside of this. So you yeah. can't have a single system saying, I understand the data, but you can certainly have a single system that stores the data. And we've seen over and all, more, most people say, when and now, save it. And now the saving's been done, now how do I monetize? Save money, make money, delight my customers. And that's where machine learning steps in with very, again, simple, straightforward, but massively scalable statistical, statistical techniques that help you gain those insights. So right now the tooling is very, very primitive and has been for a super long time. Things like TensorFlow, which are open source, allow you to create models yourself, create it on something like Google Cloud Platform, or you can deploy those models to an actual device, like an IoT device or your phone. So what's big data to you could be a few thousand line items out of a million line items you have that through a visualization system you discover these are the things that will actually matter to my model and the system will say my learning rate on those pieces of data is very high. So hiring great data scientists who know how to use very good tooling, TensorFlow is one. Uh, another one that we particularly make is uh, ML Engine. We just made it GA last week, very exciting at our own conference. Uh, we're happy to showcase it here. And then the full out ML models that we run for you, like speech, natural language, vision. So I mentioned earlier, some things are unstructured data. Those things are largely homogenous on how you solve them. So why not just, I'll just use those things for 50 cents per 10,000 calls for it. I don't want to invest in machine science for there. But my own ERP system, or how do I do my own database mining? I want to own that. So that's why we make tools for both. And so Google has probably done this well for years, and we, we all know that's been the case. But you guys have evolved, and you kind of evolved the cloud. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of were cloud 1.0, and you were digital natives to begin with. How do you see that progressing? Are we at a new era of the cloud right now, and are we at a new mm -hmm. inflection point to where all this machine learning, all this massive amounts of data, storage, retrieval, real-time streaming, all those things are converging. Are we at a new era? And if we are, where is that going? Um, that is a great question. Uh, that's paying for a lot of people's houses or making a lot of people sad, depending on the outcome. I'm in the cloud business, so I'm a very loaded and biased um, surveyor of the marketplace. I will say that most people agree we're maybe 5% on the journey, measured by customers doing things in it, which is, my, my view, the best corollary, where people take their dollars, where people see their value. So 5% adoption to date, typically on the people that adopt quickly, or the things that cloud can do, like arbitrarily scalable systems, uh, large sets of infrastructure, arbitrage of multiple data sets from multiple different suppliers, all those things cloud is immediately obvious for today. And largely, the security concerns which retarded early growth are being addressed. Uh, in reasonable ways by a lot of people, even down to core banking, pharmaceutical, oil and gas discovery, all those customers are on Google Cloud today. The next step though is getting the people that are in the middle of the curve. We all understand how hard it is to convince somebody who has such limited budget making a move on existing systems, which in some way work, in some ways maybe need some improvements, to a brand new platform. In our case, there's those two categories everyone's heard, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Google Cloud spends a lot of time writing fully managed services. So the idea is sometimes it's not how do I do this better, it's why are you still doing it? A great Let's example is if I had yep. perfectly scalable storage that was 15 nines available, why would I do backups? If I could do uh, taglines inside of the data set that indicate this is a Monday, this is a Tuesday, this is a th uh, Thursday, and you can roll it all back, backups as a concept become less important for you as a business, depending on the day load and the shape of the data. Same thing for things like machine learning models and other things which people recognize that data mass matters. So why did machine learning come from all these cloud companies first at super large scale? It's because the data is localized, compute is abundantly available in large general purpose cloud platforms like our own, and then all you need is science and smarts that are written into the software, and Google has both of those. So that's probably why we're an early leader in the space. A long way to go to normalize this into everyday assumption that it's going to be present. Um, and one of the signposts I look for is how many startups right now say with machine learning in them, which yeah. indicates that we're early yet. They want to highlight the fact that they think they have something better. In many cases, it's substantially better. Very short story. Um, translation at Google. It's been a machine learning service for a very long time. We're, we're pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, we do 103 languages. It's one of the products I have, so I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, one of the things that we did about four months ago is we added neural network supports on what traditionally was a heuristic-based 
model system. And that sounds like, okay, we're just upgrading the tech and the model should improve slightly. We saw 85% fewer errors per call inside of our top uh, eight language pairs. That's a massive improvement in the most we've seen in well over 10 years. We're better than human translation in some of the languages today. So if we can do better than human, the next step obviously is can we speak languages that we don't know? And the answer is yes. Mm, the models under the cover can translate languages that we do not have the source from. So we're already at the Rosetta moment for spoken word. We've had natural language systems for years as well. Taking that ability to understand into an environment where humans and systems interact pretty flowingly is massively opportunistic. So self-driving cars, people inside of the box say where the car goes, the car has to understand intent, fulfill the intent and understand the world around it safer than a human can. And in many cases we're seeing early results that it's a lot safer being in a self-driving car than it is driving myself to the convention center this morning. That's excellent. And that's kind of, I don't want to say scary, but interesting future coming up soon. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the future real quickly here. Um, if you and I sat down 12 months from now, mm. here next year at this time, what would you like to say machine learning has solved in the world for, for humanity? For humanity. What, what can we yeah, do? Yeah. What can we do in that short period of time let, let me that give can make you a difference? Something that is uh, very exciting uh, for those of us that are already pretty deep in the space. Um, CAT scans, healthcare, yeah, right? Yeah, you go yeah. in, you get a scan, you come out, looks clean, you go on, you wait for your next checkup. Or that lump is nothing to worry about in many cases, though some of us have had that scare. Um, it is morally objectionable if there were a system capable of detecting early stage problems before it was humanly understandable based on 20 years of past images of your own health system. Why couldn't a machine learning model, which might improve massively, yeah. just like yeah. our translation system, yeah. every year, you should retest all recent records with the so right data inside it. of them. Yeah. Imagine yeah. the back catalog of early stage RNA fragment detection. Cancer cells die like everything else does. When those cells die, they emit RNA fragments. The ability to pull a cancer cell RNA fragment from all your normal blood cell ones is almost impossible. Almost. And it turns out with enough compute and enough data processing capability, people are attacking that problem today. And machines can solve that. Machines are More detecting humans, right. early stage issues in healthcare outcomes today. Scaling it down is our hard problem. Can we turn it into something available universally versus only at the best hospitals in the world? And that's the challenge we're picking up. Excellent. Rob, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me.